Yeah, Uygar is also here. Our next speaker, um, I'm quite excited to be announcing him and shortly introducing him. Um, he's uh, also such a special soul. Uh, I will need like half an hour maybe to start with uh, uh, to start with uh, his accomplishments and his contributions to to social activism and to uh, you know to 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 the change in Turkey actually. Uh, Uyghur is an uh, environmental scientist to begin with. He's a nature uh, enthusiast, passionate about nature. Uh, he's an uh, Ashoka Senior Fellow. He's the founder and instigator of goodfortrust.org, uh, an online platform for creating prosumer economy for ecological and social sustainability, which he will be uh, shortly uh, explaining further. He is the board chair of the Prosumer Economy Association. He has a master's in environmental science from Ohio State University. He has a PhD as a Mac MacArthur Scholar in co conservation biology, as well as in department and social change at the University of Minnesota. He founded uh, environmental engineering department at RJS University. Uh, then he joined the United Nations uh, Development Program in New York as an environmental specialist. Uh, he lived there two years and I love his uh, take from there. Uh, he has the, one of the most beautiful sustainability definitions uh, I've ever heard. Uh, and I got it from, uh, from his interview with uh, Dear Sinem. Uh, which I will also would like to thank uh, later on. She will be also joining us shortly in the afternoon. So coming back to uh, Uygar, um, he's also founder of change.org in uh, Turkey, executive director of Temo Foundation uh, for two years back in uh, 2006 to 2008, and he was a uh, director of uh, Greenpeace Mediterranean. So it was, I think uh, there are more, uh, but I would like to, I would like to, of course, uh, give him this stage. Uh, he is uh, one of the most inspiring examples of uh, why and how the hope can be achieved. Uh, and why it's the only way, you know, the action is the only way to make the change. Uh, yeah, you can have it. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. And welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> you made me blush quite a bit, I must say, I feel quite hot after your introduction, but, you know, uh, thank you, thank you so much, that was, that was wonderful. Um, yeah, it's, it's great to be here, what a wonderful name, World Hope Forum. Uh, when I first heard of it, of course, I went online, I watched all the videos, I watched uh, uh, the previous talks uh, that you did, I, I watched uh, Lee Edelcourt's um, talks and I was quite impressed I must say I mean it's it's amazing the the kind of thought and the kind of approach you're taking to design and and to the world is uh, precisely also what gives hope I think because it is where everything starts with the thinking it starts with the imagination it starts also with believing that it can come true and I think that's where where hope comes I mean I deal also with design but I don't deal with design of artifacts. I mostly uh, deal with designs of systems and how you bring things together uh, so that they can, at the end, initiate change. So why am I obsessed so much about change? Why do I want things to change? It comes from grief. It comes from sadness. It comes from wanting to protect what I love. And it is quite difficult in the giving circumstances. Uh, just every year, the Living Planet Report comes out that WWF, World Wildlife Fund, produces. The 2020 report is shocking as ever. 
from 1970 to 2020, 70% of birth populations declined. So in the 1970s, when I started bird watching 10 years ago, um, 50 years ago, we could see 10 birds in the sky. Today, we look up to the same sky and we only see three birds. And I love birds. So I lost 70% of what I have lost. And every year when the Living Planet Report comes about, I see that I'm losing more. And that's the grief. And that's what, you know, that's why I'm obsessed uh, with change. When I went to Sultan Marshes in Kaiseri at the southern slopes of Mount Argius, I went to Yai Lake, and this was in 1970s, uh, when the birds flew up, the flamingos, like 40,000 of them, the sky would go completely black, and you would see like hues of pink in the black sky. It's like 40,000 flamingos, imagine. You couldn't hear the person beside you talking because they were so loud from on, 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 all the flamingos making those sounds. And then years later, I went there. The lake was dry, not a single flamingo, only feathers in the dust. It was, the only water was probably my tears falling onto the soil. It was like so What do you do then? I mean, what do you do when something like that disappears? The only thing you can do is you start trying to change things. And that's when I tried to change things. The first thing that I did was found something which is called uh, uh, Kushbank, which is called essentially a bird uh, database. It's again, a systems design. It was about, um, we were trying to protect birds, but we didn't have the data to protect them. We didn't have enough information to be able to help in the conservation of these bird species. So therefore, uh, what we did is um, uh, I created the system. Uh, at the time, internet technology was just becoming available. Uh, and we said, OK, let's imagine a, a database that is essentially uh, online and try to identify uh, like uh, all, the, uh, uh, all the birds and then put them into this database. So we created Kushbank. And this is one of the members, the data that is being created. Uh, it's a, called a little stint. Calidris uh, minuta is this, this beautiful bird species that you're seeing. And to conserve this bird species, you actually need you know, information about its uh, whereabouts and its population uh, and so forth. So you can see the beauty uh, that, uh, that is there, but it's not only the beauty of this beautiful bird, but it's also the accomplishment. Little stint, this bird, which is this small and incredibly beautiful, travels, Essentially, every year, 12,000 kilometers from Siberia to South Africa, and then back again. Can you imagine this little bird traveling every year, one, uh, 12,000 kilometers down to South Africa from Siberia, and then up again. Here you can see, you know, here and here. From here, it starts migrating migrates all the way through Turkey and then down to South Africa. And this data comes from Kushbank. So when we first um, developed uh, Kushbank, it was a pilot project of what was called World Birds Den. So I had um, essentially um, asked the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds that we work on uh, creating this database, which I called at the time Citizen Science Project. And then uh, they took that, our pilot was then, um, you know, done all over the world. And then the Americans started eBird and then it all merged together. And finally it became 
uh, e Kushbank. And now we have a global database which we can help to essentially conserve birds. But then after designing this system, which allowed for crowdsourcing of information into a database, which was earlier left in notebooks only, I came to realize that bird populations were still declining. So uh, birds weren't necessarily uh, uh, coming back. So therefore, uh, I understood that it's not only information that is uh, enough, but you need to also at the same time be able to uh, uh, do work in civil society to activate people to actually conserve things. You need to change policy. You need to have people who are determined to conserve um, uh, the, uh, the nature that we're losing. And therefore, I started working in civil society like Anil uh, described. Uh, but then, uh, at some point, I realized that by mobilizing people through civil society, we were only doing civil society work. So we thought, okay, what happens if we activate people on the street themselves? So essentially, the campaigns to conserve nature done by organizations such as Nature Society or uh, by uh, Tema Foundation or Greenpeace, which is tremendously important work. How can we expand that even further was the question. How can we even make more change if we want to conserve uh, nature, prevent climate change, biodiversity crisis, you name it. Therefore, we say, I said to myself, okay, let's design the same thing in terms of crowdsourcing rather than birders watching birds and putting them into a database, let's have people start campaigns themselves, not civil society organizations, and fight for change themselves. Then when I had this idea, I looked around and I found change.org. And change.org at the time had 20, 000, 20 million members globally, and it wasn't in Turkey. So I found it, uh, change.org in uh, Turkey, and right now we have 18 and a half million members on the platform, which are essentially uh, doing uh, this kind of work. I mean, um, uh, let me see, yes. So here you can see uh, globally now from 20 million, it's 464 million people globally who are signing, starting campaigns, asking for social change, coming together, building forces, and uh, working towards, uh, towards change uh, together, and forcing politicians, decision makers, to take action to make things work in a, in a different way. So in that sense, it is quite effective, and it's working quite well. We have about, last year we had uh, 296 victories, so campaigns that uh, were essentially successful. Uh, that is about uh, six successful campaigns per week. In a good year, in uh, Greenpeace, we would be able to do four successful campaigns. And now, by crowdsourcing this and having masses work towards uh, change, we were essentially able to make um, a lot more uh, change in a many more uh, topics based on what people wanted to change themselves. So in that sense, uh, it was helping. But on the other hand, biodiversity, as you can see in the latest report, Living Planet report, is still declining. So even if we move in masses and ask for change, still some things and especially biodiversity is still declining. So maybe we need even something more than just, um, uh, just change. What do we need then? What is it that we need in terms of uh, creating, um, uh, creating change? When I was at Greenpeace, I brought together a lot of different experts from political parties, from civil society organizations, from academia, and we founded a group that was discussing on 
how we can actually make change. So we had dinners in the evening, you know, some people brought their own cooked food, we created this, this table around which we were discussing. Then we came up with a methodology that I, I had developed again on systems design um, uh, in the uh, early uh, 2000s. Uh, it was uh, a method which is uh, called fuzzy cognitive mapping, uh, um, an 11 step uh, system. So we came together and we created this cognitive map of what needed to be done if we wanted to have a sustainable future. So all the experts, we created these maps, and then I put them all together in a huge square matrix. I made these centrality analysis, uh, hierarchical uh, systems analysis, and so forth. And what I what came out of this analysis of academia, political parties, civil society organizations, and everything, there were two most important leverages. One was hope. The other one was the economy. So hope and economy are the largest two levers if we want to change anything to become sustainable in the future. So therefore, uh, after all of those analysis, I came up with the idea of uh, what we call the prosumer economy. So for the prosumer economy, uh, we essentially uh, created uh, Again, another system, which we call goodfortrust.org. There are more than uh, 20,000 uh, people we call prosumers and more than 363 people or uh, enterprises, which we call uh, essentially uh, uh, producers. Let me see if the English version of this is, works. Yeah prosumer producers. So we say goodness spreads by sharing. And we have prosumers who support socially and ecologically fair production. They fulfill their needs from trustable uh, producers, which we know are producing ecologically and socially fair. And they are part of a community of good people and they join forces with them to make change. Again, we have crowdsourcing. And now we have producers for whom we uh, create this whole system in which, again, they come together, they join forces for ecologically and socially uh, fair uh, production. So in that sense, uh, what we have is uh, something in which we uh, are able to essentially uh, create a new economy. This new economy we call the prosumer economy. So what does the prosumer economy mean? I mean, the word prosumer goes all the way back to Alvin Toffler in the 1970s, where uh, he was actually talk talking about the electronics industry at the time and how the consumers were part becoming uh, involved in the production system and shaping the production system itself. It's similar. Now the difference is that it has a purpose and the purpose of that uh, is to create an ecologically and socially just future for, uh, for humanity. In that sense, they again become part of the production system, but by becoming part of the production system, they're shaping it in order to be ecologically and socially fair. And for that, they built their forces together. So the key thing about the new concept of the prosumer is that it doesn't act on the individual level, but acts at the community level, building forces together in the sense crowdsourcing uh, their ability to make uh, change in uh, in society and uh, on the on the planet in our existence of how we exist. So, in creating an economy, when we look at the roots of economy, we see that it's actually moral philosophy. So economy was not economy before it was economy as a discipline. It was what was called moral philosophy. So morality was at the heart of economy, but somewhere something went wrong and we created, I think through colonialism and the formation of the company, an idea that everyone fends for themselves. So sort of a social Darwinist perspective where, you know, um, like Tennyson says, you know, uh, uh, claws in, uh, in blood. 
that isn't what society is. If we had that, we would have something like, did you watch the film Vampire Nation? You would have something like that. I mean, we are <laughs> a social species. And there's this great philosopher, uh, philosopher hist historian, historical philosopher, I think, Rutger Bregman. He has a fantastic new book called The hu Humanity. And there you will see that actually human beings are good by heart. Our system is wired to be good. Our si whenever we see someone helping someone else out, we have hormones, happiness hormones that come into our, uh, into our body. So we take pleasure in not only doing ourselves good, we even get pleasure in seeing someone else do something good for someone else. That is what makes society thick. But systems is what structures society. So the idea is how do we create a different structure, a different system, and that's where the prosumer economy comes. At the heart of the prosumer economy, which we manifest in goodfortrust.org, is the uh, ethical tenet, which is don't do unto others that you don't want to be done to yourself. The golden rule, like Anil was saying, if you enter the hall of the United Nations, the Grand Assembly, it is written in golden letters in a mural right in the lobby on the wall. And it writes, don't do unto others that you don't want to be done to yourself. And it is the basic tenet of peace. The basic, if you don't want it to be done to yourself, don't, don't do to others. If you want something to be done to yourself, do it to others, but first ask, take their consent. If you wish something for yourself, wish it for everyone. And it is as simple as that. So can we build an economy based on this basic tenet of moral philosophy, go back to its roots and create a prosumer economy? An economy where everything is circular, where we have circularity essentially means mutuality because uh, everything in nature is uh, uh, essentially a give and take. So can we create an economy is about give and take, right? We exchange goods and services. We give money, which is a pseudo for another good and service. So essentially we have this, the same kind of exchange. So take this exchange, make it circular so that we buy, deepen our supply chains in a circular way in an, in an economy where everyone goes by the golden rule and tries not to harm nature and tries not to harm other people. So in that sense, you can create a production system, which is sustainable based on this ethical tenet, and then deepen your supply chain, create a macro scale circular economy. And there you have a prosumer economy, an economy that um, essentially what I say is like a forest. Think about the Amazon forest. The Amazon forest has been there for 55 million years on this planet. For 55 million years, the Amazon forest hasn't harmed the planet, hasn't changed its climate, hasn't destroyed biodiversity, just the opposite. The Amazon forest is rich, productive, circular, and sustainable. So why can't we, as a human economy, become an Amazon forest? I think we can, and I think we will. I hope that gives hope. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I mean, I cannot add any, I cannot top it actually. I cannot top this conclusion. I really believe we should be an Amazon forest in the near future. Thank you so much, Rigar, for joining us and being with us. And uh, you're such an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have to go, unfortunately, but if you have any questions, my email for everyone is uygar at goodfortrust.org. So feel free to contact me and I'm happy to, you know, come back. Um, it was very uh, beautiful to listen to uh, both uh, uh, Asla Filinta and Omar Madra, my long-term uh, companion in this fight. So, uh, it was wonderful to be with you. Keep up the hope. 
and I hope the change uh, will happen. We will become a sustainable society, uh, not from very long from now. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank